again, I'm Leela McDowell, and just to, running through the rules one more time, I'm Vice President for Communications with NAACP. We are here today, this is part of our Smart and Safe Initiative, which is a way to get uh, affect smart policies on criminal justice in our country, and we have a really stellar group of people who have come together around this issue. So everyone will speak very briefly, and brevity is not the enemy of substance, so, <laughs> and then we will have uh, Q&A afterwards, and again, if you would be kind enough to state your name and what media you're with before you answer your qu ask your question, that would be great. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce President Benjamin Todd Jealous, who is President and CEO of the NAACP. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is great to be here with you. Uh, we're here today to talk about a very important subject. Five percent of the world's people live in this country, but we also have 25 percent of the world's prisoners. Together, this great, bold, bipartisan group is here today to say a few very basic things. One, our prison system is too big. Not only have the policies that have made it so failed, they don't make us safer, they needlessly break up families, and they waste dollars. Better, cheaper, safer alternatives need to be embraced. In the current budget crisis across this country, it is critical that our states follow so many others who right now are taking a tough look at so-called tough on crime policies and saying it is time to switch. It's time to stop being tough and stupid. It's time to be smart and safe. That is what all of us here today have consensus on. That is what we agree on. We at the NAACP and many of the groups here today, including the CCPOA, the Cal you know, also known as the California Prison Guards Union, go further and say most of the money that can be saved by shifting from failed, tough on crime policies to proven smart on crime policies should be reinvested in schools, in uh, universities, and in those investments that actually provide an environment of success for our children. Simply put, this multi-decade trend of prioritizing incarceration above education is not sustainable for a country whose prosperity is based on innovation. As an old Italian saying goes, a family can only afford to be rich and stupid for one generation. And we are way past that point. We are heartened that already in states from New York to South Carolina to California to Mississippi, Smart on crime reforms have begun to take root, and bipartisan bills are presently moving in states as diverse as Florida, Texas, Virginia, Georgia, and of course, several other states. We hope that this report and the bipartisan consensus that you, hear, that you see here today will help accelerate that trend. To the point of, of uh, personal privilege, one of the people you will hear from today, David Gelbaum, is the biggest donor in the history to the NAACP. In the, in the history of our great association. And, and he is supporting this work. It is, it is a great honor here to have him with us and, and as a CEO uh, and in, of an investor in dozens of clean tech companies, he's somebody who can really speak to the fact that this trend is something that our country simply cannot afford to continue. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to congratulate President Ben Jealous and the, and, the, and the NAACP for getting the job done and making this historic day happen. Uh, ben said I was the largest donor in history to the NAACP, and that's true. And I also provided $20 million to the National Voter Fund in 2000. The National Voter Fund, I'm going to say some things that some people aren't going to like, but I've been the donor of this thing, and the world's going to know who I am. Okay, the National Voter Fund paid for and ran the bird ad. The 
Burdett was a polarizing ad which set back the fight against felony disenfranchisement. It offended and antagonized President Bush, who in 1997, as governor of Texas, had struck a great blow against felony disenfranchisement when Texas eliminated the two-year waiting period and adopted a policy of restoration of the vote upon release. Elimination of the waiting period was restored the vote to 317,000 individuals. Today, in contrast, President Ben Jealous and the NAACP have brought together a diverse group of people from all across the political spectrum. Mass incarceration, and I'm speaking for myself and not for the NAACP, mass incarceration is a cruel policy and a national disgrace, as is felony disenfranchisement. Mass incarceration results in millions of people having the young years of their lives taken from them, leaving them with social and psychological damage. Today, there are more African-American men in prison than there were held as slaves in 1850. And in states like Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, about 30% of African-American men cannot exercise their right to vote. So I am grateful to be able to stand in the fight with President Ben Jealous and the NAACP against mass incarceration and felony disenfranchisement. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I just, we have an abundance of riches today, and I wanted to also let you know we have some stellar people here who can answer questions afterwards or we can arrange some one-on-ones. Robert Rooks, who is the director of our criminal justice program and one of the co-authors of the report, Misplaced Priorities. We also have Stephanie Brown, who is the national field director of the NAACP and head of youth and college, who is here, right there. And we have Pat Nolan. Pat Nolan is the vice president of the pris of prison fellowship. And Pat has been one of the strong hands in bringing this coalition together. And we're very honored and grateful to have you here, Mr. Nolan. Uh, I'm sure everyone sees his op-ed, which we've put in the press kit. We would urge you to read that. We also have with us Brady Cassis, who is here rec uh, representing uh, Speaker Newt Gingrich. And Speaker Gingrich has a letter in your press packet that he has sent to us in support of this effort. So I wanted to let you know about that. Um, and up next, we have with us Secretary Rod Page, who was Secretary of Education under the Bush administration. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to join with the NAACP and its call to action to policymakers and leaders to provide the leadership necessary to re-examine our present citizen and incarceration policies in such of a new agenda that would reprioritize resources from incarceration to educational opportunities. President Jealous has already made my case, so I don't have to repeat what he said. But I would call your attention to the fact that we are arriving at a point where we have all across our nation rising prison budgets and falling education budgets. This is inconsistent with a great nation. It's something that we've got to fix right away. Now, for those who would want to mischaracterize our effort, I want you to be clear about a certain point here. And that point is this. This is a call not to be soft on crime. This is a call to be smarter on how we deal with crime. This is a call to be smarter about how we spend taxpayers' dollars to achieve public safety, while at the same time ensuring that we spend the dollars right and the public is well served. We're fully aware that for public safety purposes, there are some people who need to be locked up. We're also aware that there are too many people locked up who could be served in other ways and could be helped in other ways and made better for our society. So what we want to do is be smarter. Now, my particular interest is education. And I believe that too many of our dollars are being burned up incarcerating people. I want to see more of those dollars used in our public schools all across our nation. Mm -hmm. Educational leaders are crying for support because they're all suffering on a budget, uh, budgetary impact. And we've got to find ways to relieve this problem. And one of the ways, although I want to relieve 100% of the problem, one of the ways is to reprioritize education 
in this expensive way that we're locking so many people up and find ways to serve people who can be served better in other ways and redirect those dollars to the most important function I can think of, and that is educating the youth of this country. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Page. And um, we will now be joined by also um, Mr. Mitch Kapoor, who <laughs> I hope I said your name correctly. Good. Um, and he is an entrepreneur and a philanthropist. Many of you probably know him from Lotus fame. Thank you. So thank you for having me here today. Uh, as a business person, a philanthropist, and a citizen, I believe as a country, we have to be committed to creating an environment for success and achievement for all of our youth. And if we're going to find our way back to being first in the world, uh, in terms of being globally competitive, uh, we have to stop leading the world and locking people up. It's that simple. We all know our education system is suffering. It just does not offer equal opportunities to all students. And I know from personal experience, low-income and minority students are consistently denied access to high-quality teachers, rigorous curricula, and academic resources afforded to others. 30 years ago in California, we spent about 11% of the budget on education and 3% on prisons. And believe it or not, today, those proportions have just about exactly flipped. Quite unbelievable. We cannot continue doing this kind of business as usual. And we cannot be competitive as a nation if we're leaving half our children behind. One of my passions is increasing access to quality education for underrepresented students. And we've seen that making these kinds of investments makes a huge difference. Uh, my wife and I have started a summer math and science honors academy that serves as a pipeline in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics for uh, young people high school age from low-income communities of color. Uh, we started uh, at UC Berkeley, we're now uh, at Stanford, and we're in the process of making this into a national program. And we take kids with the potential to succeed, uh, but who are not on a path to succeed, and we help them get into places like MIT and Cal and Stanford and the Ivy League. And these kids are amazing and inspiring, and it's a testament, and it gives us, gives us all hope. I'll point out that the country is undergoing dramatic shifts uh, in its uh, uh, demography. Uh, we're becoming a majority minority uh, country. We all already are uh, uh, for under 18 in 10 states, including uh, California. And if we continue to invest disproportionately in locking up low-income youth of color and filling up prisons and jail cells, uh, rather than creating an educated workforce, especially in the STEM fields, there is no way that we're going to remain competitive in the global marketplace. So investing in the human potential of all of our youth is not merely altruistic, it is also very pragmatic. Uh, it grows our economy and benefits all of us, and that's why I'm proud to be here today in support of this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kapoor. And continuing on around the theme of education, we have the United States Student Association President, Lindsay Mikulski. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, as president of the U.S. Student Association, we're an organization um, that believes that education is a right. Um, we're an association of college students that work to break down barriers to college access, um, particularly for communities have, that have historically faced harsh barriers to college access, such as, um, such as communities of color, uh, women, and low-income communities. Um, Young, for young people in the United States, opportunity in, in this year of 2011 seems, seems limited um, to us. We all know that the youth unemployment rate is double um, what the national unemployment rate is. Um, and with African Americans between 16 and 24 shouldering a crushing 33% unemployment rate, um, this is obviously a huge problem for young people. Uh, as we also know, college is becoming increasingly um, out of reach for many, and the average college student who does get to go to school um, borrows nearly $25,000 um, to go, and uh, which has led to Americans um, owing more now in student loan debt than credit card debt. So for our generation right now, um, things are difficult. 
Um, however, amidst this crisis for young Americans, uh, we see the, that incar incarceration is being prioritized um, instead of our elected officials working to build a more equitable K through 12 system, uh, making college more affordable and accessible to more students and creating jobs for our generation. Uh, I'm from the state of Massachusetts, uh, which where I attended the University of Massachusetts. Um, and, and as a student, I was really engaged in fighting back against state cuts um, to our university and, and tuition and fee hikes. Um, my peers and I were told time and time again by elected officials there that there was no funding for the state's public colleges and universities and there was no way that they could find uh, money in the budget to prioritize higher education. So we started to do some research about what the money was going towards and found that you know, the state of Massachusetts, like many other states now, uh, were spending more money incarcerating its citizens than on its public colleges and universities. Prisons are winning the budget battle at the state level and public higher education is losing with corrections funding at the state level growing at a rate six times more uh, than the rate of higher education over the course of the past 20 years. These priorities send young people a loud and clear message that it's not that there isn't money in the budget to invest in us and in our future, but it's simply not the priority. Our country is not setting the expectation that young people can succeed by getting an education and joining the workforce because our elected officials at the state and national levels are not affording us those opportunities. Um, so USSA is, is proud to be here um, standing in solidarity with the NAACP and working on this effort um, because we believe that education is the right and that we should be investing in education um, instead of incarceration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, and now we'd like to bring out one of, certainly one of the leading voices in the conservative movement, Mr. Grover Norquist. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> a few years ago, a number of conservatives uh, in D.C. began a working group, just sitting around six, maybe ten of us, uh, thinking through uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, discovered we thought that there were 2,000 federal crimes. Turns out there are about 4,000 federal crimes you can go to prison for. Uh, looking at mandatory minimums um, and uh, what the costs of incarceration were uh, at the state level, the local level, uh, and at the national level. Uh, within the last year, uh, Pat Nolan and others have taken a leading role uh, in organizing Right on Crime, uh, center-right activists uh, and political leaders, focusing on how much do we spend on incarceration? Are we getting our money's worth is what, what is the cost-benefit analysis when somebody gets sentenced to prison? How much are you actually uh, spending on these issues? And I think it's been helpful because conservatives have not focused on these issues over the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, I think a lot of times conservatives focused on those things the government was doing that we didn't think they ought to do at all. And so you just focus on getting them to knock that off and not focus on those parts of the government where the government should be doing um, things. Uh, such as having prisons or national defense, and asking yourself, are we spending money wisely? Are we, could we spend it more intelligently? Could we save taxpayer dollars uh, in doing it different ways? And uh, the Texas Public Policy uh, Foundation is taking a leading role in this. Texas has moved forward. And I think in terms of convincing state legislators, I was just testifying in uh, Florida recently on behalf of a number of, of initiatives, and the fact that Texas had done it had reduced incarceration rates, had saved taxpayer dollars, uh, had, had decided not to build four prisons because they didn't need to uh, anymore with a focus on uh, uh, rehabilitation for uh, uh, some people who might otherwise have gone to uh, prison uh, for $20,000 a, a year or more. Uh, the fact that Texas had gone first and it had success made a lot of people who ordinarily would have gone, I don't want to hear this, I don't, you know, I'm not sure I believe this, they, Texas did it, and then all of a sudden they sort of put down their pens and papers and, and started listening. So I think uh, center-right uh, activists, as well as those who've been uh, more traditionally involved in looking at incarceration and prison and judicial reform, uh, has, has built a good coalition, and we're making some real progress. Texas out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norquist. See, I didn't lie. Brevity is not the enemy of substance. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, we'd like to bring up now Laura Murphy, who's the director of the Washington Legislati Legislative Office of the ACLU. 
Thank you. Um, first, I have to say to Ben Jealous, um, our families have known each other for at least three generations, and there is never a time when you call the ACLU that you won't get your phone call returned. So we're so happy to be in partnership with you once again. We've worked very closely for the last 20 years with the NAACP. Um, we reduced the sentencing in crack powder cocaine. We got President Obama to sign into law a bipartisan bill, um, the Fair Sentencing Act of 2010. And, and Grover and Pat, the ACLU has been working with you at least a decade on the Patriot Act, um, uh, trying to get Congress to see that there are bipartisan solutions to a lot of our civil liberties challenges. So we're here today, though, to talk about the NAACP's report, which I read last night and I found fascinating, and I think we need to take this show on the road. Um, the ACLU has made ending mass incarceration and reforming our criminal justice system a top organizational priority. It's just irresponsible for us to sit idly by and let our government lock up so many young people and treat racial and ethnic minorities unfairly and just squander public resources. Grover, you're so important to this battle. Um, we will be on Capitol Hill this year fighting a bipartisan bill, the Gang Abatement and Prevention Act, which is about to uh, get a number of co-sponsors and be introduced that would lock up young people in adult facilities, would be an enormous waste of resources. But what's different this year is the Heritage Foundation has said that this is a budget buster. This costs over a billion dollars. So if we can come together on legislation like this, we can take this show back to the states, back to Congress, and people will begin to see that places like Texas get it right. You can lower incarceration rates, and you can be more effective in fighting um, a crime. So we're in a unique position to fight this criminal justice uh, juggernaut because we've got 53 affiliates. And of the 70 billion that's spent annually on prisons and jails, 50 billion is spent by states. And so we are planning to continue our work. And I just wanna give you a story about Mississippi. There's a young man um, in, in Mississippi named Richard Wade. Richard is a middle school student. He was expelled from school because authorities illegally searched his cell phone and found photos that they deemed to be gang-related activities. And they were actually pictures of Richard dancing in the privacy of his own, own home. After we intervened on his behalf, we got the school to agree to revise its gang policies. And in state after state, in Texas, we were there on the ground with conservatives. We have been working. In California, we are pushing back against the governor's proposal to shift prison costs from the state to the county level. In Ohio, we're fighting against the privatization of state prisons. I could go on and on, and I see um, Ms. McDowell out of the corner of my eye, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll say in closing, in, it's time for our communities, our lawmakers, and law enforcement to come up with real workable solutions to keep our kids out of jail and in classrooms where they belong, Secretary Page. On this issue, we cannot afford to fail. And the ACLU, for its part, stands in solidarity with all of the speakers, and we will continue to make over-incarceration and getting rid of over-incarceration a priority and continue to work with you so that we can decrease our prison population and free up more dollars for much needed education reforms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, I mean literally on the front line of this problem is Mike Jimenez who is the um, not only the the head of the California Correction Peace Officers Association, but also works with Corrections USA, which is a national organization representing over 80,000 correctional officers. He's on the front lines. He sees the devastation to the human potential every day. Um, so certainly, last but not least, Mr. Jimenez. Thank you, Leela. And I will be very brief, and I want to start by thanking uh, Ben and the NAACP for having the wisdom and the courage to take this on um, at this such an important time. If you haven't had an opportunity to read the report, and I know many of you haven't, take a moment and read the report. The authors of the report, I want to thank you as well. 
um, as I read the report yesterday, I was looking for something in there that I could find to disagree with, and I couldn't find anything. When I was done, I set the report down, and it, it occurred to me that uh, all I had to say was, duh. Uh, the ongoing cyclical removal and return of authority figures from these uh, uh, minority communities undermines the social fabric of our country, and it cannot continue. Incarceration is the most expensive alternative to dealing with any of these individuals, for dealing with drug addicts, for dealing with mentally ill offenders. Uh, incarceration is the most expensive at $50,000 a year, and the insanity has got to stop. And David, I hope you do piss people off. I hope everybody gets pissed off when they read the report, uh, because it's high time uh, to make a change. And uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be standing here on the front lines with you, uh, Ben, to make that change and the, the esteemed uh, speakers that are here today. Thank you very much. I hope folks realize that that last speech came from the head of the California Prison Guards Union. I hope that that really sinks in with you. That's what the CCPOA is. Uh, and as a child in California, they were uh, the force that pushed through most of the tough on crime laws in our state. So to have the head of that union, the most powerful lobby in California, say to you what, what you heard today is a very big deal. With that, I'm happy to take questions. And of course, if you have questions for the other speakers, in fact, I would ask, um, if the speakers could just come forward and we can have them stand here, folks, have questions, we can pop back and forth to the microphone. Uh, just one quick thing. Um, before we start, we're going to take questions from press only, and then if there's time afterwards, we'd be happy to take questions from some of the others who are here. Um, so press only, please, and identify your name and, and who you're with. Do we have questions from the press? Well, we, you know, we, we're active in each state across the country, and we're especially active on this issue right now in Texas, for instance. And Texas is really ground zero for cooperation between um, Tea Party activists and NAACP activists on these issues. We have 18 smart on crime bills moving right now in Texas. Many of those have Tea Party-backed um, politicians as their sponsors. And of course, all of them have card-carrying card carrying NAACP members as their sponsors. Um, we're excited about that. We're excited about Georgia, where the governor of Georgia, uh, Governor Deal, has pro proposed a um, criminal justice uh, review process that would literally look at all of the laws in the entire state, all the sentencing laws, all the reentry laws, all the law enforcement policies, and ask the question that we're asking every single state to ask, which is what works? What's effective? What makes us safer? Because when you answer those questions, as, as, as all of us up here have found, um, what you end up with uh, are policies that look very different than, than those policies that, for instance, have made Georgia the fifth largest incarcerator in the country, with far from the fifth largest population. So that's two examples, and we're engaged across the country. That's hard. You know, I, I think that, that the, uh, some of it's sort of hidden in the details. I mean, we, we say quite frankly in there that um, people in this country are 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. If you dig into that and you look at the comparative data for other countries, what you find out is that black people in this country right now are five times more likely to be incarcerated than black people in South Africa at the height of apartheid. It's deeply disturbing. Because at that moment, South Africa was the world's leading incarcerator. So now, not only have we taken the title, but we've taken it to an entirely new level. And you know, what's also deeply disturbing is the data we found on the relationship between student achievement 
and whether or not they live in a high incarceration neighborhood. In other words, you can look at two zip codes where people are similarly poor. All sorts of socio-demographics are similar, but what's different is the incarceration rate. Perhaps one is a different sheriff than the other. And the 10th grade math achievement is much lower, much lower. Why? Because as Mike said, we've taken the parents out of the household, we've taken dad out of the household. Even if dad just asked Junior, are you doing your homework, it helps. And more and more, we're taking women out of the household. And the kids are broken up and they're put into foster care. And we have to understand, you know, when you have, for instance, some private prison companies forecasting future uh, prison loads based on third grade math achievement and literacy levels, that this is literally becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Any other questions from the press? Go ahead, gentlemen. All right, we're going to let Pat Nolan take that first. Yeah. Hey, Cliff. Uh, good to see you here. Thank you for covering this. A couple of things. Crime has dropped dramatically in the United States in the last 20 years. It dropped as we were building more prisons, and we continued to build more prisons. If you look at the states, and, and that, those are national figures, but really we're 51 different prison systems, the 50 states and the federal ones. It's fascinating those states that have cut their prison population by wisely separating dangerous offenders from those who are just mad at and punishing those who are mad at in the community rather than incarcerating them, those states have had a lower crime rate. It's dropped more than the states that have continued to build more prisons. A great example is Florida versus New York. New York cut its prison population by making that important distinction between dangerous criminals and those that have just broken the rules and, uh, and in the process of that lowered their crime rate by about 16 percent. Florida continued to incarcerate more and its crime rate dropped by about half of that. And let me say about the New York figures, it's dramatic the drop in violent crime in New York. In New York City in 94 there were uh, 2,400 murders. This year, there are going to be about 400 murders. And they've done that while they've been lowering the prison population. Why? Because they're making intelligent choices. Conservatives should not give a blank check to the prison system. It should hold it accountable to say, are we getting more public safety for each new dollar we spend? And so we're not saying anybody is a victim. What we're saying is that those offenders that break nonviolent rules there's probably better ways to handle them than sending them to a very expensive prison where they're put in with violent people because the skills they learn to survive inside our violent prisons make them more dangerous when they get out. So we're undercutting public safety by sending low-risk offenders to prison. My mom used to say, uh, vegetables take on the flavor of the stew pot. And if you take somebody that has not been involved in violence and put them in a very violent prison, to survive, they're going to have to be violent. I was on the National Prison Rape Elimination Commission. And in American prisons, this is a scandal that isn't talked much about. In American prisons, the Bureau of Justice Statistics say in an average year, 216,000 inmates are raped. That's 600 a day in our prisons. And they're usually the nonviolent offenders. They're the young, slightly built, inexperienced in the ways of crime, and they can't defend themselves. That is wrong. It's immoral. And I represent Prison Fellowship, and the church has to speak out on these things. So yes, Cliff, some of these folks have broken our rules. But they're knuckleheads. They can't follow the rules. And that doesn't mean they're dangerous. So we should instead try to help them figure out a way to live a responsible life. Sending them to prison for those low-risk offenders is not the way to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Nolan. Any other questions from the press? Yes, ma'am? I'm sorry, it's time for you. I'm a Blake Peterson from the Green Movement Militia. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that I had is that is there a sense of how much money these judges are saving? As in, we know that it's $50,000 a year, as uh, Mr. Jimenez said, to incarcerate folks. Do we have a total of figures for how much they're taking into 
educate about treatment. I'm going to take the first job in after school program, things like that. See if there's anybody else who wants to. Grover is the expert on this on this panel, but he had to step out. Um, Mike, do you want to talk about Okay. Well, Something less? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the uh, PAC can do it. Yeah. The, we can. Because they're, it's state by state. Not only did we succeed in Texas, where they had three prisons in the books ready to be built that they took off the table, save that money. They put a third of it into treatment for drug addicts and a third into treatment of the mentally ill. Two thirds of it went to fill the hole in their budget. In South Carolina, a left right coalition last year passed reforms, again, separating violent criminals from nonviolent criminals, and they're going to save $175 million this year alone, plus an operating cost of not having to run that prison. So those are real savings, and they're state by state. I don't know anybody that's aggregated what the total is, but it's substantial. $175 million for South Carolina will go a long way toward doing other things that are more important than just locking up people we're uh, bad at. I can't give you a hard figure for each state, but I also think we ought to factor in the cost of destroying families, the cost of not allowing people to vote, the cost of, um, uh, you know, things like a barber's license in many states uh, will not be uh, granted to someone who's an ex-offender. So the economic cost of, of, of these destroyed families, of people having their, inter their education interrupted, of them not being able to participate in the in the civic process, those are additional costs that I think we ought to consider, not just the hard financial numbers. One study has suggested that dollar for dollar drug treatment is seven times more effective than prison. Do we have more questions? Yes, sir. Can I just follow up on a question about privatization? Mm -hmm. That's a big issue. Sure. Yep. I heard, I think the ACLU was opposed to that, but is the ACP, yes. do you reject that as a solution? We as an organization do reject prison privatization. Uh, the, the groups up here have very different views on that. We're here to talk about what we ag agree on. If you're asking for the NAACP perspective, yes, we generally oppose prison privatization. Well, actually, in California, I don't have to go out and recruit anybody to come to prison to keep members' jobs. And it's, a, it's an unfortunate reality of life that, I'm, that we're never going to close all of our prisons. Um, that's just reality. And I think that what you're hearing from me is what you're hearing from uh, you, labor leaders, unions, uh, from everybody across the nation at this time of, of a budget crisis is that we've got to figure out how to do things better, uh, more streamlined, more cost effective, and that's what we're here talking about today. And that was, uh, I, I don't know who it was asked the question, but that Mr. Nolan answered. We're not talking about the wholesale release of all, everybody from prison. What we're talking about is being smart about how we do it and smart about who we keep there. And that's what we've got to do in California to be more effective, is be smart about how we do it. And we'll take a couple more last questions from the press, if there are any. Press, press, press. Uh, well, just let me see if anybody else hasn't had it, and then I'll, I'll get back to you. Are you with the press? Great. <laughs> Well, the quality of education certainly plays a role in, in uh, preparing young people to be effective citizens uh, and, and to live among uh, their peers. So that is one of the ways that we need to uh, go about trying to reduce the number of people who are sent to prison. But uh, we also need the types of resources to do that. And so what we are arguing about today is uh, budgets growing for prisons and budgets being decreased for education. And that, I think, is the uh, mix in this situation that disturbs me most. We want to see if we can save dollars from locking people up and uh, pre prepare more dollars to prepare young people so they can live in America as effective citizens. Mitch, K Mitch Kapoor, who's founder of 
Lotus and has spent much of his life in recent decades getting young people uh, from very tough neighborhoods into top schools um, will come up to talk about what it actually takes, what resources kids need. I think we'll get to your question. So what, what we have found is if you go into a low-income community of color and you look at a school and you look at the kids and you strip away sort of stereotypes and expectations, you find out that the kids are across exactly the same spectrum of talent as any other kids and you have a lot of them who want to make something of their lives and who want to advance and do whatever they can and they're not being challenged, they're not being offered that opportunity. A lot of urban school systems set such extraordinarily low expectations, they're really holding pens, uh, you know, in a, in, in a pipeline to prison. Um, if on the other hand, and this is not just ex the experience in our program, but the experience wherever uh, urban education reform has been successful, you really challenge the kids, meaning you say, we are going to provide you the resources, the, the teaching and the opportunity uh, to make something of yourself but you're going to have to do all the work. In fact, you're going to have to work harder than other kids who are less well prepared. But that's a bargain we'll strike with you. Then if you do that and give them the resources and challenge them, and we have our kids who come and give up three summers of high school and work 10 hours a day, six days a week, making up the math and science that they're not getting in their schools because we can identify who has the potential to succeed at MIT. We give them the challenge. We help them rise to that occasion. But I'll remind you, they do all that work. What needs to happen is to take the successful education experiments, which are showing that these kids can achieve, uh, and figure out how to scale them nationally across uh, all of our schools, and that's a big challenge. But it would be a mistake to think we don't know how to do that, because we do, and we now have sets of studies actually showing that that can happen. So why don't we take uh, one last press question. I won't leave you out, I promise, but I just want to see if there's any other press questions. All right, gentlemen. I uh, looked through the report real quickly, uh, but I didn't see any estimate of how much of the cost of the prisons and the criminal justice system comes because of the costs associated with incarcerating illegal aliens and illegal alien criminals. Uh, can you give us that figure, and how much would we save as a country by simply keeping the illegals out and preventing them from here. Um, that's true that's not in the report and we don't have that figure. Thanks. Well, why not? All right. Why, why wouldn't you have that figure? All right. So the, that's not the focus of the report. But thank you for your question. And we are going to end it now and thank everyone who came. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you again very much for your attendance here. <laughs> <laughs>